there's a puzzle about why we have this idea that civilizations or nations are kind of these homogeneous wholes. And this idea is really the product of, of a powerful intellectual tradition that goes back, I think, at least to Herder in, 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 in the late 18th century, early 19th century Herderian thought, which thinks of the important national groups, the folk, the folks, as defined by a common, what he called a Sprachgeist, a shared spirit of the language, and which led to the idea that if you wanted to, as it were, create a modern German nation, and th this is the early 19th century idea, you had to collect the folk law. The Grimm brothers had not only to create the Deutsches Wörterbuch, they had to create the fairy tales, because they were the tales of the German folk. Um, and the, and, at the same time, Germany is defined by the tales of the folk, it's defined by Goethe, Helderlin, and, and, the, and the language of the poets, and, and the novelists, and the philosophers. And, and the point is, these are all supposed to fit together into one thing, right? They're supposed to be an organic unity. This is crazy. The idea that there's an organic unity. There's a mistake we make in thinking about these identities, these vast so-called civilizational identities. We tend to exaggerate various features of them. One feature we exaggerate is the extent to which they are the same over time. So people have this idea that there's something called Christian civilization, that roughly speaking it was the same, you know, in the, by the ninth century or something, by the time of uh, the Holy Roman Empire, it was all fixed in place. Not true. Christianity has changed enormously, not just with the Reformation, but in many ways since then. And the same, of course, is true with Islam. Islam has changed over time, and that's, so it's just a mistake to think of it as one thing in that sense over time. But of course, the other great mistake we tend to make is to think of them as internally homogeneous, as not having within them the kinds of uh, divisions and complexity that, in fact, all interesting groups have. Uh, nations have this. Uh, no, the, the, a nation isn't defined by everybody having the same view about anything. Um, certainly the West isn't defined by a set of agreements. There are no things that everybody in the West, whatever you take the West to be, agrees about. What is European literature? There's, there's, there's Shakespeare, there's Racine, there's Holberg, there's, uh, there's Goethe, uh, there's Dante. Wonderful, all of them, I love them. But, but it, it sort of doesn't help, I think, to say that they're European, nor does it help to say that we, okay, they're all European, so we need them to understand each other, but we don't need to understand anything from outside Europe. Uh, Goethe read Hafiz, and he wouldn't have written the West Östliche Divan if he hadn't read Hafiz. You can't understand Goethe without knowing something about, I mean, fully, without knowing something about uh, the reception of Persian poetry in Europe. So th the boundaries are always, culture is like that. Culture crosses boundaries. That's why it's, that's, that, that we, live, we can live with it because we can take things and mix them up. Now, I understand that there are people who feel under threat when they've lived happily in their village all their lives and then somebody comes in and wants to, you know, kill animals in a new way or put up new kinds of buildings or... But, but that's true if the, piece and if the person is putting up the new building is, is, a, is a large supermarket. It doesn't, it's not just true with minarets and, and mosques. And that's true if you have a settled sense of how human beings should relate to animals and then people start eating new animals, animals that you weren't eating around here before. Uh, there's no special problem uh, about, uh, about Muslim migrants. Uh, there's just a problem, if you think there's this problem that, you know, oh, there's, there's this way, which is the European way, and there's that way, which is the Muslim way, and for some reason you don't want to mix them up. I, as I say, I understand that people like settlement continuity, but the, the obstacles to that are mostly not made in Europe by Muslims. They're made by uh, capitalism, <laughs> uh, which it's capitalism that destroys buildings and, re and builds new buildings. It's capitalism that builds big roads that go through the pastures where you used to walk when you were a child. Uh, I'm not, I'm, this is not an argument against capitalism. It's just saying that that, part, that feature of our lives, those changes in our lives, are not mostly the work of migrants. What we have in common is a set of stories, he didn't put it this, this is a sort of modern way of putting it, a set of stories um, 
uh, and he said a set of things we remember and a set of things we forget, <laughs> we agree to forget, and a commitment to a common future. Without the commitment to the common future, the stories are sort of pointless. I mean, they, they, they're not going anywhere. Uh, narratives have uh, an, an energy that moves them, and you tell a story about where you've been because it sort of points you to where you're going. So, to the extent that people feel either in a kind of end of history mode, that there's nowhere to go, that the, w w there's no up, uh, I think the right thing to say to them is, you have a terrible misunderstanding about the world. There's, there's lots of up. Once you think about what there is to be changed and how wonderful it would be to change it, uh, then I think you, you can't turn your, your eye away. And, and then you have to think, what story of who I am as a German, as a European, as a, as a citizen of the world, what story of I am, of who I am, can I use to help me pick among the many ways in which I can help us all move forward?